Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2024 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of How We Must Fight Against the Demagogy of Fascists and Social Fascists by Earl Browder from 1931. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. There are links to Patreon and buy me a coffee in the video description. So this piece is another installment in our series on first wave U.S. anti-revisionism. A lot of this series is going to be pulling from a collection called Marxism-Leninism vs. Revisionism, which was concerned with the phenomenon known as Browderism in the era of World War II and immediately afterward. Earl Browder was the General Secretary of CPUSA, the Communist Party of the United States, and at one point he was a really good communist. We actually just did four pieces from him on the channel in two videos. One of the videos has three pieces. And we're going to do one or two more from this earlier period before we read his stuff from the 40s, which is what got him expelled from CPUSA. So as we read this piece, remember that 1931 was close in time to the 1929 crash and the onset of the Great Depression. Let's begin. Demagogy on an unprecedented scale, is today the principal weapon of the capitalist class to hold back the rising wave of discontent of the million masses of workers, just as police clubs and gas bombs are the principal weapons against the vanguard of the workers who are already mobilized on the streets for struggle. Demagogy and police clubs are twin weapons, used interchangeably and simultaneously, to demoralize and break down the demands of the workers for relief from the terrible burdens of the crisis. The working class and its vanguard, the Communist Party, have made less progress in fighting demagogy than in fighting the police terror. Therefore, this question must be the object of our special study. Where are our greatest weaknesses in fighting the demagogy of the capitalist class and its agents? Social Fascist Demagogy Most Dangerous The demagogy of Republican and Democratic politicians, while the main enemy in this field in point of volume, and material backing, in terms of press, organization, etc., is not the most difficult to expose and overcome politically among the more advanced workers. Hoover's demagogy, for example, about no wage cuts, has already exposed itself so effectively that it is the butt of rude jokes even by the capitalist press. But it is the demagogy of the social fascists, the Socialist Party and its groups and grouplets, some elements in the American Federation of Labor, and the groups of renegades from the communist movement, Trotskyites and Lovestoneites, which is politically most dangerous because it is most deceptively masked, most liable to mislead and confuse the vanguard itself. Therefore, it is the social fascists, especially the, quote, left variety, which constitute the main enemy in the struggle against demagogy. The crisis of capitalism forces the masses to look for a solution, for some way out of the crisis. It is clear that a new path must be found. In the search for the path, the workers are forced to choose between that leading to fascism, the path of restoration of capitalism at the expense of the workers, and on the other hand, the path leading to proletarian revolution, the overthrow of capitalism by the working class, and the establishment of a new order of society. It is the role of the social fascists to lead the revolting workers onto the path of fascism under the illusion that they're traveling towards socialism. Comment. In the last couple of years, I talked a lot in the live streams and elsewhere about horseshoeification of politics. The so-called horseshoe theory, which says that the, quote, extreme left and extreme right are basically the same or that they converge like two ends of a horseshoe, is not correct. However, the capitalists put out all kinds of pseudo-left options which do lead people back around to the right. So in the U.S., for example, you get people who are disgusted with the Democratic Party and they want to move left. But instead of getting onto a Marxist path, which actually leads left, but is completely camouflaged and has all kinds of fake warning signs placed around it by the capitalists, don't go this way, this leads to tyranny and dictatorship, etc. So they put these fake things that curve back around to the right, and then before you know it, you think you went left, and that was the direction that you started out in, but the path changed under your feet, and then you suddenly find yourself in Tucker Carlson's audience, or Russell Brand's, or whatever. So, it is the role of the social fascists to lead the revolting workers onto the path of fascism under the illusion that they are traveling towards socialism. That is exactly what I was talking about. Continuing, 
This is the greatest danger to the development of the revolutionary movement in the USA. That is why we must concentrate upon the exposure of the social fascists and the burning out of all traces of their influence within the ranks of the Communist Party. Hoover's Stagger System and the Social Fascists For purposes of brevity and concreteness, we will here examine this problem only in a few specific examples. The capitalist solution of the crisis demands that the burdens be placed upon the workers. Comment, this is austerity, shared sacrifice, etc. for those who remember 2008. Continuing, the 10 million unemployed must be sternly denied unemployment insurance, must be denied any cash relief from government treasuries, must be given the very minimum of food relief in the most degrading forms of charity, and must be forced to work for a miserable wage just sufficient to keep them alive accustoming them by millions to a standard of life lower than that of pre-crisis times by 50 to 70 percent. The entire wages bill of the capitalist class is to be cut in half. On this basis, the capitalist class hopes to restore its production by winning the markets of the world from its competitors. The chief immediate tactical aim in putting this stupendous plan over on the workers is expressed in the Hoover Stagger Plan, to divide the work and also the wages on a lowered scale among those at present unemployed, presenting this as a substitute for insurance and relief. The Hoover Stagger Plan is the symbol of a fascist solution of the crisis. Against this, the working class solution of the crisis presents itself in an unrelenting fight for unemployment insurance, immediate relief at the expense of government and employers administered by the workers, struggle against wage reductions and the speed-up, and for the seven-hour day without reduction of weekly pay. The issue is thus presented sharply and definitely. Thus placed before the working class, there is no doubt which they will choose. Therefore, the capitalist class has serious need of servants who will prevent this sharp presentation of the issue, who will confuse the workers, who will blind the workers to the definite choice they must make, who will create the illusion that the workers and capitalists can, quote, jointly, solve the problem by reconciling their class interests in a common program. Such servants are the social fascists. Thus, when Hoover first announced his program on unemployment, it was at once given the blessings of the Reverend Norman Thomas in the name of the Socialist Party. Thomas declared that Hoover's program was, quote, socialist, and that he should be criticized not for his policy, but only for not carrying it out quickly and thoroughly enough. This gave the theme for all the further music of social fascist demagogy. One and all, the American Federation of Labor, Socialist Party, the Must Group, the renegades from communism, raised their voices in various keys and variations, singing Hoover's fascist stagger plan to the tune of socialism. Using the shorter workday slogan for fascism. The social fascists brought the stagger plan to the workers in the robes of the shorter workday. Quote, have they not, they demanded to know, been fighting for generations for a shorter workday? Now is the opportunity to achieve this goal, therefore, when the capitalist class is trying to keep the masses from hunger and revolution without cost to itself. Hoover said stagger plan. The, quote, socialists in the AFL said shorter workday, but they both meant exactly the same thing. At the Boston Convention of the AFL, the Metal Trades Department took the lead in this demagogy by demanding a five-hour day and five-day week, while at the same time approving the Hoover Green Compact of stabilizing wage rates at the present level. With present hours of labor at approximately 50 hours per week in the manufacturing industry, the realization of this slogan means cutting the living standards of the workers by 50%. And when the actual carrying out of the Hoover Green Agreement is shown to be actual wage slashes in every industry and locality, the reduction runs from 60 to 75 percent. In short, it is nothing but a disguised and exaggerated form of the stagger plan. The Socialist Party joined in the game with the slogan slightly modified to six-hour day and five-day week. This was immediately taken up by the Trotskyite renegades as their own original discovery, and the Communist Party was denounced by them as an enemy of the working class because it refused to join the chorus that extended from Hoover to Cannon. Lovestone, after a little hesitation, also joined in. The united front for the Stagger Plan had, indeed, become a broad and inclusive one. Hoover's game was working fine. Hesitation within the Communist Party This campaign of demagogy was so brazen, so well organized, and for a while so confusing in its effect upon the masses, that it even had its effect within the ranks of the Communist Party. 
causing hesitations in carrying through the task of unmasking the hypocritical capitalist rottenness behind the demagogy, a task which required boldness and resoluteness. Such dangerous hesitations, for example, reached the point where a well-known leader of the revolutionary trade unions in the USA could write in the magazine of the Red International of Labor Unions in that we must give, quote, serious and immediate attention to the question of revising our seven-hour slogan downward and declaring that failing to do this, quote, we allow the social fascists to appear as the champions of the shorter workday, unquote. Quoting again, this he says we must prevent at all costs, unquote. He sees no way to fight this demagogy except by taking up the slogan of the demagogues. Of course, Comrade Dunn saw clearly that the social fascists raised their slogans for five-hour and six-hour days because they, quote, fit in perfectly with the Hoover scheme of rotating jobs and cutting wages, unquote. But he failed to see that his own proposal to try to take these slogans away from the social fascists amounted to surrender to the demagogy and not to struggle against it. Hoover would, indeed, have scored a great victory if his campaign had succeeded in determining even the slogans of the Communist Party. In discussing this question within the party, some of our comrades developed this point of view in even more extreme and dangerous forms. They were so impressed by the campaign of demagogy that they already thought our slogan of a seven-hour day was causing us to, quote, drag behind the movement, and even that, quote, we are not leading the shorter hour movement, but are actually opposing it, unquote. This was a serious error, and it handicapped our campaign to expose the true nature of the social fascist demagogy as part of the Hoover Stagger Plan. An Error of the Political Bureau In correctly combating such hesitations and wrong views within the party, our political bureau itself fell into error by formulating our slogan as seven-hour day and five-day week, instead of seven-hour day without reduction of pay. The latter is the correct general slogan of the struggle for a shorter workday, and we should bring forward the seven-hour demand together with the five-day week only in such cases where the workers involved have already achieved the eight-hour day and five-day week, and where they are ready to practically organize a struggle for new gains along this line. This error in our use of the seven-hour slogan is a long-standing one, it's true, and it dates back before Hoover's Stagger Plan. But that does not change its political nature, which is that of a concession to demagogy, a weakness in combating the wrong proposals to adopt the six-hour slogan. All such hesitations and vacillations must be cured if our party is to properly lead the workers against the social fascists for real struggle against the Hoover solution of the crisis. The Revolutionary Solution of the Crisis Our party has, in the main, developed the correct line for the working class struggle under the conditions of the crisis. This line leads away from the capitalist solution of the crisis and in the direction of the revolutionary working class solution. We have not sufficiently, however, drawn all the conclusions which must follow from this generally correct line. We have not sufficiently, in a concrete manner, exposed the social fascists as the servants of Hoover and capitalism. And we have not developed for the masses a simple, popular formation of the revolutionary proletarian solution of the crisis, in such a way as to directly connect it up with the everyday life of the workers, give them a broad view of the historical task to be accomplished, and at the same time make them understand the immediate steps that must be taken to bring the entire working class onto this proletarian path of struggle. The development of our propaganda and agitation along this line, deepening it and developing all its revolutionary implications in the light of everyday reality, is the task to which we must give our best thoughts and energies. It is along this way that we will defeat the demagogy of the fascists and social fascists and lead the million masses into struggle against capitalism. And that's the end of the audiobook. There is a follow-up piece to this called The Meaning of Social Fascism, its historical and theoretical background by Browder, which does develop some more of the topics he was just discussing. I am currently debating whether to do that one on the channel or not. It is a bit longer, it's like a 50-page PDF, but again, if I don't end up reading it, I would suggest that you read it on your own as we progress through the rest of the series in the interest of time. But again, the title is The Meaning of Social Fascism, Its Historical and Theoretical Background. And you can find that within the Earl Browder archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org. Otherwise, what did you think? Leave a question or comment in the comments section below, and we will continue the discussion there as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. 
And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for a few dollars a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. They allow me to spend more time on this channel, researching content, planning content, producing content, and promoting content. So if you like the channel, thank me, but also thank a supporter because this channel is non-commercial, viewer supported, and that support is essential. Beyond that, engagement counts, so like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, even if it's thanks, good video, or random letters, some of our staples here at Socialism for All. And after you have engaged in agitation and education online, make sure to organize in real life, connect with your local left, and bring the lessons that you learned here into those real-world struggles. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.